Welcome everyone to the VSET First Teach for Child Development and Care in the Early Years and Health and Social Care Level 1-2 Technical Award or VSET. This is a recording of the live virtual event that took place on the 12th of July 2022 and here we will share the slides and the information as well as good practice and advice from your fellow practitioners. So the aims for today's session are to provide an overview of the Level 1-2 Technical Awards in child development and care in the early years and health and social care. We will also be summarising the resources available to providers and identifying the support that's available from the provider development team. So we'll start off with some introductions. So we are from the provider development team here at NCFE. Our goal is to support you in the teaching and delivery of our qualifications. So today we're joined by myself, my colleague Sarah and Tracy. So I will allow pass over to Tracy to introduce herself. Hi, thank you, Marina. Yep. So I'm Tracy. Uh, my background is teaching NFE and um, teaching health and social care. So as part of the P pro provider development team, I support in the delivery of teaching and learning through consultations and CPD events. And I'm going to pass you to Sarah, who's going to tell you a bit more about herself. Thanks, Tracy. Um, so, yeah, my name's Sarah, and also part of the provider development team. My background is primary education, reception, all the way through to year six. And I work within the provider development team to support on early years and childcare qualifications, here to help on understanding the qualification spec teaching and learning activities, and all things child development. Thanks, Marina. Thank you, Sarah and Tracy. Right, so we're going through the learning outcomes for today's session. So our goal is to introduce the VCERTs and provide a brief overview of the qualification, covering the structure and briefly how it will be assessed. We're also going to provide a summary of the changes from the current model, for those of you who are delivering or familiar with the current specification. We will then look at the content areas and have a go at some teaching and learning activities and sharing best practice from our live event and your fellow practitioners. We also look at curriculum planning. So we have an opportunity to look at your learner's journey and help create a mode roadmap so you can better understand and teach the indicative content. And there will be a summary of the resources available to support you and your learners, as well as best practice on teaching and learning activities from your fellow practitioners. In the assessment and quality assurance section, we will briefly look at assessment objectives and a more detailed overview of the non-examined assessment or NEA, including regulations and moderations. We'll also look at feedback and we'll look at sample assessment material that is available. So we started off with our live session, asking our practitioners to rate their confidence in their chosen visa so on a scale of one to 10 one being not confident and 10 being extremely confident. And we had the results, it was quite mixed. So there was a 50-50 split in confidence, for people feeling five or less, and then recording six or above, the majority of people feeling six or seven. And if this is you right now watching this, absolutely do not worry. We all have moments where we're new and we don't understand, but we're hoping that you will travel a journey with us and we can improve that confidence. So I'll start with session one. I'll provide a brief introduction to the VSERTs and an overview of the qualification. So there have been no new qualifications added to performance tables since 2018. So we've had a relatively long and sustained period of stability in the world of vocational qualifications. But with new technical guidance and changes from the DfE, New qualifications um, have been a long time in the making. We've seen this massive shift in the vocational landscape for 2024 and 2025. While there used to be around 74 qualifications approved for performance table, we're now down to 48. So we can be confident that we're all higher quality level one, two qualifications, which are of great value to our pupils. So I want to point out some of the key features of the new technical guidance from the DfE. So all these qualifications must be a minimum of 120 GLH. 
So these are similar, if not equal in size to the GCSEs. At least 40% of the total marks have to be available through assessment by examination. And there is now a terminal assessment rule. So what this means is the assessment must be taken at the end of the study. So it's the last thing that the student does towards the qualification. Up to 60% of marks will be available through non-examined assessment. And finally, that non-examined assessment is now numerically marked, so not graded, and it must be moderated by an awarding organisation. So those are the new rules. I'm now going to take you through how we've applied these specifically to the health and social care and child development and care in the early years VSERTs. So we, where before we may, we had several different units, we now have one unit with several different content areas. And these are 120 GLH plus assessment times. We have no summative assessment until the final year of delivery. And this is gives you the opportunity to cover that content area, really focus with your learners and then take them through the assessment. So minimizing that administrative burden on you. The non-examined assessment, which we call the NEA, has a 50% weighting and the examined assessment, the EA, also has a 50% weighting. This is a combined level one, two qualification to recognize the achievement of all learners meaning all learners take the same qualifications and the grades are from a level one pass to a level two distinction star. So you can see here from the table how that compares to the current GCSE grading. And we have here at the bottom an example. This is by no means prescriptive, but an example of how you could deliver, how you could structure your VSERT delivery. So focusing on that delivery in the first year, and then focusing on the NEA and examined assessment. We'll go through the NEA and structure later on. So now looking at the health and social care. So here we have a summary. You will notice the qualification number. That's a really useful number to jot down if you would like to search for the qualification specification or any more detail on QualHub. The quickest way is to put in the qualification number to ensure you have the latest and newest model of the specification. The total guided learning hours for health and social care is 135, because we have a 13 hour non-examined assessment. And like I said before, it's a 50-50 weighting between the NEA and the EA. More detail of this can be found in the qualification specification on QualHub. Now moving on to child development and care in the early years. Again, note the different qualification number. This one has a 14 hour non-examined assessment, bringing the guided learning hours to 136. Again, we have that 50-50 weighting between the NEA and the EEA. So despite the change in the VSERT model, you'll find much of the content from the old model remains the same and will filter through those content areas. But there's some notable new knowledge areas which I would like to highlight. So here we have <clears throat> the previous model. And there will be an opportunity to use the resources that you have created in delivering this model, if you have delivered this model before, with the new indicative content. So here we have the new model and I've highlighted some areas that have notable differences. So for the child development and care in the early years, play and the role of play, play activities in supporting child development is explicit and the role of the early years practitioner during play activities in this new model. You will notice a lot of similarities between child development and the health and social care new models. Indeed, some of you may be teaching both qualifications. And as the two do complement each other, there is capacity that they could be taught alongside. So legislation is not new. It's a fundamental part of both the child and health qualifications. However, there are more legislations and a real focus on highlighting the differences between legislation, policy, and how procedure and legislation underpins the policy and underpins the implementations of procedures in the earlier setting and a different social head different health and social care settings. 
So don't be daunted by this. The unit has been very well received on other quals and gives really gives a context to learners and their role and where that foundation comes from. The final new area of learning I want to draw your attention to is planning in the early years. So there's a new focus area, the purpose of a child centred approach and planning cycle and the planning cycle process. Also new is the planning cycle for the health and social care. Whilst the planning cycle itself is not new, there is a detailed focus on its approach and making it more vocationally focused and that holistic approach. So we have for child for child development, we have child centered care, the cycle, planning, observation and assessment. And for health and social care, we have person centered care, the cycle, assess and implement review. So this planning is a key part of the NEA and a key focus of either development planning in child development or the care planning for health and social care. As always, use the qualification spec and indicative content for the NEA. We also have a sample NEA on the NCFE website to help you focus that teaching and delivery and observe these key different areas. So I'm now going to hand over to Tracy to go into more detail on the specification and teaching resources. Thank you, Marina. So that was really informative. Uh, breaking down and exploring the new depth of spe specific content area as well as highlighting the new areas and it really leads perfectly into our next session and um, we will aim to break up some of the next session um, with some examples of um, good practice from your fellow practitioners from the live workshop and make sure you take away um, information resources that will support you in your daily practice. So first we're going to look at the specification teaching and content areas. So we're looking at the learning journey and we're going to break that up into two parts. And the first part we're going to look at is curriculum planning. So the process of curriculum planning and curriculum sequencing is about mapping out skills and knowledge and content across your school curriculum. So that way the learners build on what they've learnt before, exploring content areas and how they could be themed together to give that holistic overview and allowing for natural connections to be made. Sequencing the learning properly provides a smooth, incrementally progressive learning journey where each small step allows the learner to be successful in a continuous way. From a quality insurance or Ofsted perspective, how aware are your learners of the results of their formative assessment activities they're completing? Some areas which might be important to include are subject specific, those English, maths and digital skills, those work in industry skills such as communication, analytical and evaluative skills, and many others such as problem solving, proactivity, professionalism. But this list is not exhaustive and it would need to be individualized for each learner. So now we're gonna have a look at a really effective quote that we're gonna look at now and Sarah is also gonna look at and build on when looking at formative assessment later on. It is a really effective quote when considering curriculum design, teaching and learning sequencing. The delivery, the delivery of the what you need to teach from this qual spec does not need to be, nor was it the intent for it to be delivered linear. Space practice or distributed practice, which Dylan refers to, means spacing retrieval and recall of knowledge out over a period of time rather than crammed practice regularly revisiting prior learning material. This is an important part of an effective planned curriculum, providing opportunity for learners to forget and relearn supports that transfer of knowledge to the long term memory. So now we're going to look a little bit more detail about how you could plan this curriculum. So considering the content area, let's explore for a moment a blocked approach versus interleaving and how space learning and retrieval can support delivery of the new model VSERT. Block study, which involves studying a topic in its entirety before moving on to another, may have suited previous VSERT models, which featured end of unit assessments. Your students may even prefer a blocked approach and use this in their independent studies. Arguably, with a blocked approach, it can at the time feel like a boost to learning, much like cramming last minute for an exam. 
However, the information isn't being transferred to a long term memory, which needs to be the primary focus. It's important that effective learning strategies are modelled during delivery to the students so they can be effective in their preparation for the exam and assessment. With the new model of research such that students no longer do end of unit assessments, this ability to sort of retain and recall that large piece of information has become even more important. And the science of learning evidence is that interleaving is the most effective strategy. The example on the screen explores learners using a blocked approach compared to an interleave. So content one, content two, content three, content four, that's your blocked. And then the numbers underneath is an example of interleaving. Interleaving refers to mixing up subjects, topics, or in the case of VSERT's content areas, instead of blocking them together. The interleaving approach shows how students switch between topics while revisiting in order to improve and deepen their learning. Mixing up the order of the content area that students learn within a subject benefits not only the long-term memory of what is being studied, but helps students to make connections and leads to benefits in the transfer of learned skills. This linking forward and back is really important part of the learner journey, which we'll look at next. So the next part that we're going to look at in relation to the learning journey is resources and session planning to build on that curriculum planning. So first thing we've got to look at is the teaching and learning resources that NCFE have for yourselves. So I'm really pleased to know that there will be free classroom packs available containing ready to go teaching and learning materials so you can sort of have essentials just to get up and running with everything you need to deliver the visa effectively. The classroom packs will be in digital and editable format and will be free to download. There will be schemes of work which complete outline entire un units of work based on one hour session lessons for each content area. The schemas of work will contain an additional level of detail to help you deliver your lessons and include with suggested timings, lesson aims, learning outcomes and even suggested assessment activities. You will have complete PowerPoint presentations covering the teaching content from the specification and includes teaching activities that could be used with your learners. There will be comprehensive workbooks to complement the scheme of work, which will contain classroom based activities to recap and assess learning. The workbook will also include independent study tasks that can be used as homework or flipped learning opportunities, whatever you decide. Furthermore, the workbooks will contain learning roundups, which will be short form of assessments for learners to assess their knowledge using similar questions, such as multiple choice questions to those that will be used in external assessment. As with all these resources, it is best to use them and adjust them to suit your learners. So what else is going to be available for yourselves? So at the moment, there are no textbooks in Deliverant for Health and Social Care from Hodger at the moment. However, the Child Development and Care in the Early Years, there will be a textbook which is expected to be released this year in August in time for the first teacher September. Please go to Hodder's website, have a look and just keep you up to yourself up to date with when that release date will be. It's going to be comprehensive, so gain in-depth knowledge of each content area with clear explanations of every concept and topic and easy to follow chapters. It's going to be accessible, reliable and trusted, so structured to match the specification and provide students with the information they need to build knowledge, understanding and skills. It's designed to support all students, boost confidence when tackling the internal non-examined and external examined assessments with plenty of activities to test and consolidate knowledge. The go-to guide is created by expert authors, having carefully designed tasks and activities to build skill set in order to aid progression and questions to assess understanding. Explore different resources that could be used as part of session planning. And that's what we're going to look at next. What other resources can we use as part of planning? So an example that we have here um, is around section three in health and section five in child. And it's around legislation. So one way to observe the skills and behaviour of your student is through active learning and group participation activities. It can show their communication skills, ability to adapt to their approach, problem solving capabilities, and the resilience, all important skills which needed to be developed alongside their knowledge. 
In this resource example, you can facilitate active learning for one of the trickier content area. Around the classroom, you could pin up legislation and policies from the qualification spec. The students then link the policy to the legislation using string. This supports the students from a visual point of view that in regards to one piece of legislation can inform many different policies. Then provide students with a number of different procedures expected within their role of childcare or health prof healthcare professionals. Then they will explore which of these procedures are governed by policies. Again, connect those with strength, perhaps using a different colour. You then present them with a table similar to this one, which breaks down the legislation policy and procedures, and the students might then must complete the missing boxes. The activities column is then used to follow up tasks for the students to practice the practical activities, which they would have to do in industry. Another teaching activity that you could look at is finger lights. This is the fastest finger where you could get the students to scan text for key vocabulary, dates and names, improving reading skills, comprehension and a really good possible stimulus for a starter or plenary. Another example that you could use in your delivery is walkabout bingo, which assesses understanding. This task encourages the students to talk to one another, going beyond the typical think, pair and share, as they have to engage with different members of the class. It's very important to create, and it's very that sharing environment. It's very simple to create and also very adaptable. Students can ask their peers one question each, read the crowd their answer and then a name and then move on. The first person to have all the answers fills out shouts bingo. So these are some examples that we came up with. Our first main workshop with your uh, fellow practitioners was around sharing for practices. So we're going to explore some ideas that they came up with that you could use in your practice. So first of all, child development, you can see a wide range of ideas for the different content areas, from sorting activities, documentaries, visiting a day nursery to see activities and how they relate to developmental areas. A good one was a day in the life of nursery worker, where they highlighted legislation, policies and procedures they follow on a working day. Flower babies or in polystyrene eggs, whichever your um, your school uses to sort of understand rules and responsibilities and follow instructions to make a Play-Doh sculpture to explore different fine motor skills. All excellent ideas. So as you can see, a key, key theme across all content area is doing that visiting of the early years environment and observing that live real experience. Moving on to um, teaching and learning activity ideas in health. So in health and social care, the key activities around teaching and learning that you can see across all content areas are role plays, employer links and case studies to sort of contextualise that knowledge. In childcare, there was a discussion around creating a map for local early year provisions. Linking that to suggestions here, you could get the students to create a map of statutory, private and voluntary services in your local area or nationally, or both. You can then see the students can find their policies and procedures on their website, pop that on the map, followed by linking to a third content area of how and why people access these services and that could be put up on the map. This allows for a real interactive teaching material. It allows links across content areas, but also allows for a wall of work that is continually being used and developed rather than being passive posters on the wall. So now I'm going to move you over. I'm going to move you over. I'm now going to pass you over to Sarah, who is going to have a look more at assessment and quality insurance with you. Thank you. You're on mute, Sarah. Thank you. Thanks very much, Tracy. Really, really good session there on the idea of the learner journey and the many different elements of that and some really, really good ideas from fellow practitioners from our previous session. So I'm going to take us now and we're going to have a look at assessment and quality assurance. We're going to look at the summative assessments of the visa and then move on to formative assessment, tying back in 
to Tracy's learner journey. So the assessment of our technical awards is mapped against assessment objectives. The assessment objectives provide a consistent framework across all research for learners and are applied synoptically, allowing your learners um, to show their knowledge, understanding and skills from across the full breadth of the qualification. On the slide on your screen now, you can see the approximate weightings for both child development and for health and social care um, for each of the assessment objectives. The overall weighting percentages are given in each specification. The NEA includes assessments of assessment object, the assessment of assessment objectives one to five and the EA includes assessment of AO1 to AO3 only. Um, so AO4 and AO5 are not included in the EA. So to give an overview of the NEA, I'll take you through um, the summary of the non-examined assessment. The NEA is a practical project that your students undertake in controlled and supervised conditions. It is externally set by NCFE and it is available from the 1st of September every year with the first opportunity starting in September 2023. Please refer to the NEA regulations for further in-depth guidance and information. Um, but a little bit more detail um, for you to take away from the session is that the NEA is an open book. So your learners may access teaching and learning material, including their own personal notes to complete their assessment but no teaching and learning material may be submitted as evidence. All the content should be delivered to the learners before they start the assessment. So while it is available from September, we don't imagine many providers will be re ready to administer it until December or January. You may well want to undertake a mock as well um, to ensure your students are ready So that idea that you might do your mock before December, before they break up, get that marked, give them feedback and then administer your NEA in January on return. But that's flexible for yourselves, but just making sure that all of that content is delivered before you administer it. The learner's evidence is internally marked and quality assured um, on QualHub. Uh, please refer to the course file documents and um, more useful information on there for you. The marks for the NEA need to be submitted by the 30th of April each year. And there will be specific training on the NEA, uh, administering it, marking the marking criteria, moderation, and that will be available later on this year around October time. So our focus for looking at the NEA today is to get a sense of the type of activities that your students will be completing, the criteria and skills that are present and to use these to develop teaching and learning strategies for you to use with your learners in and out of the classroom. So the slide on the screen now shows the NEA tasks for both child development and health and social care, including the marks to be awarded for each section. Each year, the tasks will remain relatively the same for each qualification, uh, but the brief that is released to students in September will change. Sample assessment materials are available and we'll have a look at those shortly. So having a look at feedback and what can you what feedback can you give to your students during the NEA? 
Your learners can rework their evidence at any point during the supervised sessions. Supervisors or assessors can identify areas which do not meet the required standard or criteria. However, you cannot give the detail of what is missing or needs improving to learners. Learners should use this feedback and decide for themselves how to improve the remainder of their project. It is expected that the assessment will take place throughout the project and not just at the end, as there is no resubmission opportunity. As there will be only one attempt at the NEA per session, this will allow you, the teachers, to focus on the delivery of the content, reducing that administrative burden, and it will make it easier to fit the research qualification into your curriculum alongside general qualifications. OK, so we should be able to see now some sample material on your screen. The sample material is available for the NEA and these are used for you to practice your projects and um, you can fit them in wherever it works best for you, be that summer in year 10 or January when your students are in year 11, whenever you feel it will be most beneficial for your learners. The idea that all the content needs to be delivered, making sure that they have covered enough of the content to be confident at attempting the sample material. It consists of an introduction, what the synoptic assessment is, information for learners, including the assessment objectives, the marks and the weightings, the project brief, the assessment tasks and a learner declaration. There is also within the sample material, the sample mark scheme and that consists of the assessment task, associated mark scheme, um, including the descriptors, available marks and the indicative content for each of the assessment um, objectives. The sample assessment material including all the mark schemes is available for you to access on NCFE's VSERT page on the website. So you can now see on the screen the sample assessment material for the EA. This one is for the health and social care, but the same is available for child development. And these can be used as mock exams. And again, you can fit them in wherever it is best for yourselves and your students. It consists of the learner instructions so that you can prepare your students for um, their live assessment. Information and details around the questions which are divided into sections with marks that are awarded for each question. So building in that um, exam prep with your students that they're looking at how many marks they can get for each question and therefore how much time do they spend on them before they move on building all of that in. The mark scheme is available again for the EA and it consists of the marking guidelines and answers including which assessment objectives the question refers to. For the higher mark questions, the mark scheme details the level the marks can, that can be awarded and the description for each assessment objective and the indicative content. And again, all of this material can be found on NCFE's VSERT uh, page within our website. OK, so we've looked at the summative assessments and now we'll tie back in to Chase's learner journey and look at formative assessment techniques that you can use in your everyday teaching and learning the importance of them and some of the feedback from your fellow practitioners of ideas that you can put into practice. So I'm going to go back to the quote that Tracy shared with you before from Dylan Williams, um, but we're going to look at the other part of the quote now, um, which really stands out um, when we consider that curriculum planning, and that is practice testing feel the word testing evokes very strong reactions but it is a part of life your students within this qualification are going to be tested in both the ea and the nea so it's important that we build that into the curriculum planning 
uh, they'll also continue to be tested as they continue in further education, higher education, or sometimes even in employment and also in real life, for example, uh, their driving lessons, which I'm sure all your students will be looking forward to. However, if we change testing to retrieval so that it reads the benefit of practised retrieval and distributed learning are two of the most strongly supported learning strategies in all of psychology, it somehow feels more acceptable. In the context of curriculum planning and design, mapping the core content knowledge and understanding effectively, allowing that natural overlap and the natural holistic links, which uh, are evident in the curriculums for both child development and health and social care, alongside carefully considered space practice and well-designed retrieval tasks and testing, it's an excellent formative assessment opportunity for you as a practitioner, whilst also helping prepare your students for the summative assessment and their core exam papers. When viewed as a positive teaching and learning opportunity to assess prior knowledge, correct misconceptions, and from there develop knowledge and understanding further, the content of the visa provides authentic teaching and learning opportunities for your students um, to revisit and retrieve their learning, building connections and developing essential skills. Research has also suggested that regular retrieval practice can reduce exam anxiety. So we'll move on uh, now and have a look at formative assessment and where it fits in with the new model of terminal assessment. Um, with that idea of terminal assessments, that formative assessment throughout your two years of delivery becomes ever more important part of the student um, learner journey um, to track progress of your students so you know where they are. Provider development team, myself and my colleagues, um, can support you with formative assessment strategies and ideas to help you prepare your students for those summative assessments that we've discussed. Um, to support you in your preparation for first teaching September 2022, uh, we'll spend the next part of this session looking at formative assessment and how explicitly planning for it is a vital part of that learner journey. So, considering the key strategies that Tracy discussed before, that idea of knowledge, skills and behaviours, those strategies of uh, formative learning, how can we make sure where your students are, how do your students know where they are, um, one approach that we can look at for that is live marking. So live marking puts a greater emphasis on the verbal dialogue um, that is scripted between yourselves and your students, targeting to help students improve their work. This means that your students can instantly act upon the feedback, all whilst significantly reducing uh, written marking for yourself as the teachers. Live marking permits the teacher to give students very concise regular feedback that's acted on immediately to ensure that progress is made within the lesson. I am aware that some of you may well be governed by a marking policy and understand that for Ofsted purposes progress, progress is not always evident in this situation with live marking. One way to uh, negate that is yellow box marking. So Yellow box marking can overcome the issue um, of live feedback where it isn't documented with a more targeted approach to mark, mark, marking that ensures teachers and students focus on a specific area of the work rather than the entire piece. That encourages teachers' feedback to be more diagnostic to support improvement. The area of the work is clearly marked with the yellow box 
and focusing on key marking points from the lesson intentions ensures teachers and students focus on specific areas of work. Um, a study found that learners valued the verbal feedback over written feedback and it was stated that students who received verbal feedback perceived the feedback to be better in terms of quality using quantity and timing and usefulness compared to students who received written feedback. So that idea that your yellow box um, marks the area that's being improved, but it's verbal feedback, which is more effective to the students. This can also come from peer or self feedback and makes the feedback instant, immediately actionable, and you get formative feedback, as you will see where the common errors uh, are or misconceptions from the content that you've delivered that you need to address. The final idea that you can see on the screen there regarding feedback is the idea of repeating the content, which goes back to Tracy's idea of interleaving um, and intervals between teaching and feedback activities linked to the idea of formative assessment. How do you know? But again, uh, reiterating, more importantly, your students know that they have retained new knowledge and understand how to retrieve it and apply it across a subject area. And on the screen, you've got another Dylan um, image there, for that idea of how you can mark um, in quality percentage time managing that workload. So we've discussed feedback and uh, formative assessment um, and feedback and its importance for students. Um, we'll now have a little look at some activities that you can put into practice and sharing those ideas from pra your practitioners. So within our workshop, we went through um, three activities. One of the ones you can see on the display there, Tracy has already discussed earlier, and that's the walk about bingo. That can eventually be developed um, so that your students are writing the questions uh, for their peers to answer rather than you providing the questions as you build in that independence throughout your year, your two years of delivery. One of the other activities which we will move on to and have a look at is expand and elaborate. So you should be able to see now one of our workshop um, slides that we shared with practitioners. Expand and elaborate works by providing your students with factual statements for content areas of the qualification and then asking them to expand and elaborate with but, because and so. This will really give you that understanding of the depth of your students learning by the answers that they provide. So if we have a little look now at some of the ideas generated by your practitioners. So the one that's on your screen now, you can see that they've expanded underneath and this was looking at content areas uh, one, two and three. You would then be able to use these factual statements to complete some worksheets and tasks for your students. Again, building and developing on this, if you introduced it early in delivery, Towards the end, can your students come up with the factual statements for their peers? This can also be differentiated across your class so that for some students you are providing them with the factual statements, but other students are generating their own for their peers. You should also now be able to see how. There we go, how the activity can be adapted within class as well. Here, the your practitioners, fellow practitioners completed the task in a number of different ways. Some practitioners came up with the factual statements, whereas others completed the book because and so. So could this be a flipped learning opportunity where you give your students the book because so statements and they have to do it in reverse? What could the factual statements be from the elaboration? So lots of ways where this can be adapted, uh, differentiated and introduced to your students. I've got the a final one that you 
may be able to use um, and that you will have maybe some ideas and generated from that I'd, again where they've got the buts because and so completed and then could you work that back the factual statements and um, could you have it where some of your students are perhaps correcting the factual statements have are they not right? Could it be a matching activity where they're given the book because so and so many factual statements and they have to match the pairs to one another. So lots of ideas where that could be adapted and adjusted into your teaching and learning. The next activity that we did within our workshop um, with practitioners was the thinking and linking grid. So the idea of this activity is that it really reinforces those tier two and tier three vocabulary from within the content areas, which your students would need um, to be able to use from spelling them correctly to understanding um, the definitions of them and the importance of them. So the idea of this activity is that your students um, have got the vocabulary there on the screen. You can see it's linked to biological and environmental factors. Your students would then pick a vocabulary from the horizontal and from the vertical and then match linking those two. Um, how do they link together? What is the connection between them? This activity can be adapted in lots of different ways as well and um, you can differentiate it by giving your students a four by four grid opposed to a six by six grid which really just focuses them on those very key core words that they may need in their NEA that you would want them to apply and use um, or you can give them a blank grid and as you're delivering that content area as they come up with as they are introduced to new words they can com can complete it themselves. So we'll move on and have a look at some of the ideas uh, generated by your practitioners. OK, so that idea there that they've started to fill it in for factors that influence the child's development. You can see there that those um, vocabulary were generated within the session. The grid isn't quite full, but it gives you that starting point for something that you may want to adapt into your practice. Likewise for early years provision. And again, for the importance of observation in the early years, generating those key vocabulary. And um, again, you may want to give some of your students a half completed um, and they can add to it or again, blank or completed grids. Building in again that practice of activities. So perhaps in September, October of year one, you're giving them the full grid. They're starting to understand how they use that activity and towards the end, they're generating them themselves. We also have a similar um, grid here shared for health and social care, the idea of uh, health and social care provision and services and then human development across the lifespan. The final activity that we came to and our workshop was jam packed um, and we didn't quite have chance for your fellow practitioners to complete this, but it gives you an idea that you can put into practice yourself is that misconception retrieval. So again, for specific areas of the content, I'm sure you will be able to list some of those common misconceptions that your students um, generate every year. The purpose of this activity being that you provide your students with the misconceptions and that they correct or better the answer. Including within your learning environment, a misconception wall where as those misconceptions arrive, your students start to write them on post-it notes and move them over means this can be used as a sort of exit activity to lessons where your students pick those misconceptions which have been generated throughout delivery and keep on correcting them so that they are no longer misconceptions. But they were some of the ideas that were generated from your practitioners that these this activity in particular was a really good one to use at the end of a, of a lesson that's available 
independently for your students to go and complete. So could you have some of these misconception grids printed in your classroom and then using that learning environment for your students to self-regulate that learning? And so finally, on your screen now, you can see perhaps some of those more traditional formative assessment examples that we might be used to, um, multiple choice questions, different question types, um, I'll let you read through those. I paused to myself reading them all. And then also looking at some of that interaction as well. How can we use um, technology to enhance that learning and building these in so that your students start to become aware of them and can use them in their revision and their self study as well. And that brings me to the end of our assessment. Um, session and I will hand back over to Marina to summarise the end of today. Thank you, Sarah. So there was some really interesting um, ideas and resources shared by your fellow practitioners, but also some foundations there for you to go away and develop some more ideas that suit your students and um, the areas that you are developing. Right, so uh, in the last session, I'd like to talk you through the support that's available to you and your centres and details of further information and guidance. So first of all, we have the NCFE website, which is a dedicated research page. You'll find resources to support your preparation, delivery and assessment of this qualification. There will be specific pages for the VSERTs in health and social care and child development care in the early years. So here you will find the specification. As well as direct links to fact sheets, which overall summarise the qualifications, the link to the correct call hub page for the newest model. You will find uh, sample assessment materials and mark schemes, both for the NEA and the EA, as well as a parent guide and some NEA regulations to help you in administering that non-examined assessment. And then a big support you have is us, the provider development team. So when you register your learners or when you're approved to deliver the qualification, you'll be contacted by a member of the provider development team as part of the onboarding process. So this service is tailored to the individual needs of your centre, your tutors, to ensure that your requirements are met. So our goal is to support you to ensure that you're prepared to teach the qualification and you're clear on the requirements for delivery and assessment. We also have a variety of other services, including regular CPD sessions, tutorial videos, mapping documents, monthly webinars, tailored workshops. But the biggest support that we offer you is you are entitled to three curriculum consultations with a member of the provider development team. So that will be a one on one consultation. Which will be over teams, typically an hour, and it will focus on your needs your questions have an opportunity for you to discuss the teaching and learning and really get into that nitty gritty. Then other support that's available to you, we have option evening packs to help your learners make informed decisions about which qualifications to take. You will have your dedicated account manager as well as downloadable resources from our website that will include information for teachers, brochures for learners, we also have uh, some subject specific Q&A drop in sessions. We've already hosted a series of these and they're available on the NCFE YouTube channel under our VSERT playlist. And there will be other opportunities to ascend, ten, excuse me, other opportunities to attend live Q&A sessions throughout the academic year. And lastly, our wonderful customer support team can help you support with first line inquiries, queries about the portal and registration and bookings. And there's a number and you can contact them directly. So in our live webinar, we once again asked our participants to rate their confidence in the delivery assessment and quality assurance for their VSERT. So one being not confident and 10 being extremely confident. And here we have the results. So you can see that we've had that shift far more People are feeling we're feeling seven to eight. We've had some people feeling nine to ten in levels of confidence. Some people still around the middle, which makes sense. Often when you start delivering, you can kind of gain that confidence. And then for those who are still feeling less confident, maybe not sure, that's where those 
one to one consultations or emails and connections with the curriculum team can help further support. So I want to just once again go over the learning outcomes as a reflection on what we've covered today. So we've introduced and provided an overview of the VCERT qualifications in child development and care in the early years and health and social care. We've created or started to create some teaching and learning activities and tasks specific to your area and shared some wonderful ideas and techniques and skeletons from your fellow practitioners to support you in your delivery. I'll be planning and reviewing your learner journey. We've summarised the resources that are available to you from NCFE and beyond. Given that overview of that non-examined assessment, focused on those formative assessment activities and tasks, and also summarise the support and information that's available. So I'd like to thank you for attending today's webinar. And we've reached the end of the session. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact either Tracy or Sarah, or if you have a general question about a different visa, feel free to contact the provider development team. So from all of us here at NCFE, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Marina.